Imagine or relive this scene. Breaking news. We just heard Kaboom here. Kaboom there. Oh, and Kaboom is also happening there. I'm referring to the explosive sound of war. Most can agree that organizations such as the United Nations and African Union have mostly kept the world in check. 193 world leaders, each with just 15 minutes. At least that's the UN guideline for how long a leader has at the famous podium. However, these organizations are still dependent on human nature. Not everyone stuck to the time frame or the script. Take Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, for example, eight years ago. On stage for 96 minutes, even ripping a page from the UN Charter, the translator reportedly fainted more than an hour into it. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. I come bearing an olive branch in one hand and the Freedom Fighters gun in the other. Do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. In 2006, US President George W. Bush and his Venezuelan counterpart Hugo Chavez upped the stakes in drama and rivalry. Every nation in this chamber has responsibilities. It got this response the following day. Yesterday, the devil came here, right here. And it smells of sulfur still today. Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe with this attack on homosexuality. We are not gays. <laughs> Proof that world leaders are only human. This handwritten note from US President George W. Bush, it reads, I think I may need a bathroom break. Delay. Khrushchev would hold his stoicism throughout Eisenhower's speech, but by September 29th, he could do so no longer. Khrushchev continued his boisterous boorish tactics. Britain's Prime Minister Macmillan was but one of his targets. Khrushchev created several interruptions, shouting and pounding on his desk beyond the recent spy plane incident. Khrushchev was angry about the UN's handling of escalating trouble in the Congo. There would be other outbursts in the weeks to follow, including one where Khrushchev allegedly took off his shoe and banged it against his desk. These theatrics pointed to a deepening divide between the East and West, something that would play out in a series of dramatic events in 1961 and 62. Pushing the world closer to all-out nuclear war than it's ever been before. When Nikita Khrushchev arrived for the 1960 session of the UN General Assembly, it marked his second visit to the United States. When he left, he never returned. So there will always be a risk of failure in diplomacy on some issues. This is where the threat of deterrence comes in. Countries in conflict are asking each other, if I do this, what you gonna do about it? For serious military disputes, most decision makers will say I'm going to run and tell Uncle America or Uncle Russia or Uncle China and so on to get involved, depending on their defense arrangements. But not all disputes require a major power to intervene. Sometimes your government just has to sweat its resources to get a solution. Take, for instance, the Kurdish separatist movement. It involves Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. This conflict has been going on since 1918. 1918. That's World War I time zone. Whatever your feelings about the Kurdish movement, it shows that a national beef not quickly resolved can become part of your inheritance whether you care or don't care for it. 
I mean, nobody who was in leadership at the start of that conflict could be alive today yet their cause is just as divisive as it was at its genesis. In my view, the biggest threat to global order isn't from internal disputes such as civil wars within a state. It's when states can't agree to disagree without violence. Had the apartheid South African government used their nuclear bombs on the armed units of the ANC and SWAPO, then there would probably have been an outcry. But this was unlikely to cause a global conflict due to the response capabilities of the ANC and SWAPO at the time. They weren't in charge of a country yet. Similarly today, it's highly unlikely that Israel will use its suspected but unconfirmed nuclear capabilities on organizations such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It's a clear mismatch and an unrecognized show of sanity by its Israel's leaders. Conventional warfare will suffice to meet its objectives. However, if the apartheid regime dropped the bomb on hostile countries such as Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Angola, then it would have been threat level up globally. Or, if Israel uses its nuclear capabilities against Iran or Syria, in fact anywhere, then suddenly these states' response capabilities become more threatening to global peace due to the defense arrangements most states have with each other. Think of how World War I started in Sarajevo in Eastern Europe, a small town of just under 300,000 people today. It was the domino effect of the defense arrangements that started the war after the assassination of the Archduke of Austria in Sarajevo. The capitals such as London, Paris, Moscow, Berlin were all untouched by the immediate violence from the assassination yet millions of people from Africa, Asia, the Oceania, and Western Europe paid with their lives to defend the decisions of their governments or colonial masters. Now, the usual path to war is diplomatic condemnations, then economic sanctions, and ultimately military persuasion. Usually it's the capitulation of a nation's capital city that will bring submission of the opposing force. That's back when bullets and artillery was the worst thing an army could bring to bear upon the enemy. What will bring submission in a nuclear conflict though remains unexplored. Don't tell me about Cuba. That's just an extension of the Sarajevo example. It wasn't Cuba that was the threat to global peace. It was the defense arrangement with Russia that was the threat. It's state wars that threaten global peace, not civil wars, and the like. Even the Soviet Union collapsed without a real change in the global powers. Look at NATO's growth in membership today. Try one of them and all of them respond. Ask Saddam how he found out. Just see how they chewed him up and he didn't even attack a NATO member. Same thing with Gaddafi. In modern history, not a single successful liberation movement destabilized the military global order. Not the Mau Mau, not Gandhi, not Fidel Castro, not ISIS, not Al-Qaeda, not even George Washington. I'm talking about absolute victory, not relative victory. Germany beat France in world wars and took Paris. America beat Mexico and took Texas. Western Europe beat the world and took it. Russia took most of what was left. Try and take Beijing today, or Moscow, or Jerusalem, or London, or Paris, or Washington. If somehow you can do this, it's an immediate change of the global military order. Do you think if the U.S. threw everything they had in their arsenal in Vietnam, they would have lost? Even though most people consider the Vietnam War a victory by the Vietnamese? Anyways, as usual, I rambled a bit. This series will review the capital cities that have or haven't proved themselves to be bastions of tranquility. Their leaders cunningly or calamitously navigated the conflicts of the past through resistance, diplomacy, or indifference. The best of them allowed their citizens to live in a sort of utopia while others in the global village suffer justly or unjustly.